that the North American F-86 Sabre was the first swept-wing fighter jet to see service with the United States Air Force, facing the formidable MiG-15 in its combat debut during the Korean War. Designed by the same company responsible for the P-51 Mustang, and building upon many lessons learned from the first generation of jet aircraft, the Sabre would become known as an incredibly capable early jet fighter and would see use in the air forces of many countries. Hello everyone, Matt from Model Minutes here, and welcome back to the workbench. Today I'm building and reviewing the 1 to 144th scale plastic model kit of the F-86F Sabre from Trumpeter. Normally, I complete a standalone unboxing video on my model kits, but I was pretty eager to get into the build of this one. There wasn't really that much to see with this kit in its own video anyway, being such a small model. So let's first take a quick look at the contents of the kit. The box has this well-drawn image of the F-86 in combat against a MiG-15. One of the edges of the box has an image of the paint scheme included, as well as some information about the history of the aircraft. The other long edge has two more images of the paint scheme included, as well as some safety information. Inside the box you'll find some instructions, the plastic parts, and a decal sheet. The instructions come printed on an A5 black and white pamphlet. A sprue map is on the front, which helps make identifying the parts much easier. All exploded diagrams are easy to understand and not particularly complicated. Colour callouts are done by names of a paint rather than a specific brand product number. The painting and decal placement guide on the back of the instructions is again reasonably easy to follow. I would prefer this to be in colour, but seeing as the entire aircraft will be painted silver, it's not much of an issue. The decal sheet has some really well printed transfers. Colours and accuracy is good, with no registration errors that I could see. The decal film looked a little thick, but hopefully it won't cause any problems later. The 32 plastic parts come on three sprues two of them being moulded in grey, and the third in clear plastic. The cockpit canopy comes in two parts and is well moulded, with some frames being present. The plastic seems to be crystal clear, with no major imperfections or flaws. The grey plastic parts are very well moulded, with only the smallest hint of flash in a few places. Raised and recessed details are present throughout the components, and I was actually impressed with the amount of detail. I've had 148th scale models with less. The plastic was to a good quality too, not being brittle or too hard. It didn't feel particularly greasy either, so I just didn't bother giving them a wash and decided to crack straight on with the build. I'll pop a list of the products I used during this build on the screen now, just in case you wanted to try any out for yourself. As always, please remember that building models can be hazardous due to the use of sharp tools and toxic paints and chemicals. Trumpeter recommends this kit to those aged 14 and over. The parts were carefully cut away from the sprue using a sharp knife. I'm going to start on the internal cockpit and nose wheel areas, so the fuselage halves were the first ones to be removed. Any rough or excess plastic was then carefully removed using a sanding stick. Tamiya Extra Thin Cement is going to be my glue of choice for this build. It was brushed into the correct area for the nose wheel gear bay to be installed. Some more cement was then applied with a brush, which will flow into any gaps and give a strong bond. The control panel was next, being carefully positioned in its slot in the floor of the cockpit. Some of the parts in this build are going to be really fiddly. I actually found it fit better in the other half of the fuselage, so I've popped it in there for now. The pilot seat and control column are next to be added. Curiously, Trumpeter included these details, but not a pilot. That's a shame. Without one, it would look odd flying around. 
I guess that means I'll be building this with the wheels down later. Humbrol 31 slate grey acrylic paint was thinned with a tiny amount of Tamiya X20A acrylic thinner to help it flow. This paint was then brushed onto the internal cockpit areas. A few thin layers of this paint would be needed. Vallejo black acrylic was thinned with a tiny amount of water this time. Sometimes I find the alcohol based thinner causes the pigments to separate on these Vallejo paints. I used this paint to carefully cover the control panel and the top of the control column. With that done, I joined the two fuselage halves together using the extra thin cement. I did have to apply some pressure to make sure that they stayed together until the glue cured. This small component is then cemented into its slot behind the cockpit. Tamiya XF20 medium grey is the next paint to be used. Again, this was thinned with Tamiya thinners. It was carefully brushed onto the area surrounding the cockpit. Tamiya XF7 flat red was then used on the back and headrests of the pilot's seat. Humbrol 209 Fire Orange was used to pick out the small component behind the cockpit. Now it's time to add more parts to the model. The tail surfaces were glued into their slot in the tail. The engine exhaust nozzle was then plugged into the hole at the back of the fuselage. The air intake cowling is cemented onto the nose of the aircraft. The wings come as one part and were the next component to be glued onto the fuselage, attaching to the hole on the bottom. I masked the cockpit canopy off screen as it was just too fiddly to film and apply the tape at the same time. The way I did it though was to carefully cut the tape using a sharp knife whilst it was on the cockpit canopy, removing the excess and revealing the canopy frames. I used white PVA glue to stick it to the model. This will dry clear and strong, but will give me enough time to move the parts around if I need to before it cures. As it comes in two parts, you could glue the canopy open if you wanted, but given the simple details in the cockpit, I thought I'd just keep it closed. The underwing drop tank comes in two halves, and it's a simple matter to cement these together. Now it's time to get on with painting the majority of the parts. I'm using this cheap can of black gloss spray paint which I got in a home hardware shop for only a pound. This will form the base layer for the silver paint I will use next. I have a tutorial for this particular method of painting silver aircraft on my channel, so take a look at that one if you would like more information. After a few thin layers of this black gloss, it was time to spray on the silver. Again, another cheap spray can which was only a pound. Who says modelling has to be expensive? When the spray paint was completely dry, the Humbrol 31 slate grey made a reappearance and it was used on the wheel wells and internal areas that were visible on the model. Again, a few thin layers were applied. The decals were then cut into more manageable sections. I'm going to use Micro Set and Sol my go-to decal setting solutions for this build. The blue bottle of Micro Set will be used first by brushing it onto the model in the correct places the decal will go. The red bottle of Micro Sol will be used later to help soften them further into the details. I soaked the decals in warm water to release them from the backing paper and after a quick application of Micro Set, they were carefully slid into position. The decals were easy enough to apply perhaps a little fiddly at times. They were slightly too thick for this scale, but with repeated applications of Micro Sol over the top, they eventually softened into the details of the model. When the decals were completely cured and dry, Humbrol 135 Satin Varnish was thinned with a little water and then brushed over the top. This would help seal and protect the transfers. The Vallejo Black was then used to paint the tyres on the wheels. This was again, due to the small size of the parts, quite difficult. I used one of the finest brushes I own to do this. Humbrol Poly Cement is quite a thick glue, and I used it on the hydraulic rams which hold the air brakes open. 
this glue will help hold them in their holes without letting them fall out. When they were in place, I also added the air brakes using the exact same process. The main landing gear can now be glued into their holes on the bottom of the model. This was followed by adding the gear bay doors. The nose gear is added in the same way, but I chose to install the doors first, then the wheel. The underwing drop tanks are next to be added. If they were glued on before the decals, it would be very hard to get those decals in the right place. So it's much better to add those drop tanks now, at this point, over the top of the decals. Now it's time for a very thin enamel wash. This is my homemade one, and again I have a tutorial on how I made this on my channel. It was brushed onto the various details and recessed panel lines, then carefully removed with a cotton bud dipped in white spirit. Finally, the masking tape on the cockpit canopy can be removed. It looks like it's done quite a good job. And it's finished. It's not a big build, but then again, it's not a big kit. Only one small problem though. The instructions didn't tell me to put extra weight in the nose and I completely forgot that it would probably need some. Sadly, this sabre is forever destined to be sitting on its tail. Not an ideal situation for any aircraft. Unless... Yep, you probably guessed it. Stick it on a display base. I used this Yoohoo general purpose glue to do this. My display base is to my standard design, with cardboard squares cut to represent a taxiway and then suitably painted, with a little static grass glued on the edges. Some of my other videos feature a more in-depth look at this particular method. With the sabre now glued on to its base, I think it's time to call this kit done. But before I round off the review on this kit and determine if it was worth the money, let's take a quick look at the history of the F-86 sabre. For this, I'd like to welcome Vladimir, who is a long-time subscriber, supporter, and watcher of the channel, who, it seems, also has a bit of a passion for history. So take it away, Vladimir. F-86 Sabre, legendary aircraft, are the ones that made the difference in the Air Force history. The F-86 is no exception. Introduced to the United States Air Force during 1940s, it served throughout 1950s, well into 60s. At the time, the F-86 set new climbing, altitude and speed records, but it was made famous during the Korean conflict as the most modern US fighter. The dogfights between the F-86 and its Soviet counterpart MiG-15 became an Air Force legend by itself. Installing a jet engine in an aircraft was a revolutionary idea, increasing its speed, versatility, climbing and almost every aspect of flight. Lessons learned from the Second World War from an aircraft such as Mi-262 demonstrated the overall superiority of jet over piston engines. Engineers and designers worked hard on fixing some of the mistakes made on Mi-262 and British Gloucester Meteor designs. The solution was to squeeze the jet engine inside a fuselage instead of being mounted on the wings. The first US jet fighters like the F-84 Thunderjet were good in ground attack missions but lacked speed and agility as they were still straight wing aircraft. The solution was to take inspiration from earlier Mi-262 in comparison to its adversaries at the time borrowing its swept wing, thus making it faster and more aerodynamic. The F-86 was the first swept wing US fighter being powered by a General Electric J-47 engine it, disco it was discovered it could reach Mach 1 and break the sound barrier in a dive. A little less than 10,000 units were produced, which makes it one of the largest production runs in military aviation history. A number of different versions of this famous aircraft were produced, but only two are the most characteristic. The F-86E, which was armed with 650 cal machine guns in the nose, and the F-86D, which the nickname which had a nickname Saber Dog. This version replaced the guns with radar instead and it was armed with unguided rockets and later A9 Sidewinder missiles. The Saber was produced under license in Canada by Canadair 
for the Royal Canadian Air Force and by CAC, Commonwealth Aircraft Company, for the Royal Australian Air Force. The F-86 Sabres were used almost all by almost all NATO countries well into 1960s, eventually being replaced by the more modern F-104G Starfighters. What a great history of a fascinating aircraft. Thanks Vladimir for that contribution. If you'd like to connect with him, I've linked his Instagram in the description of the video. Anyways, let's get on with the review of this kit. Originally tooled in 2004, the version I have here seems to be one of those original releases. The tooling has been sold with different parts to represent a later version of the Sabre and has also been sold under the Monochrome brand in a number of different boxes. I only really found a few negatives of this kit as I was building it, so let's start with those first. The lack of pilot is disappointing. It's not a scale where many pilots seem to be included, if ever, so it would have been a nice addition. Although it seems possible to glue the landing gear covers in the closed position, there isn't much point, in my opinion, if there isn't anyone flying the plane. Secondly, the decals were a little too thick for this scale. Whilst the decals are actually well printed and apply well, in a larger scale the thickness wouldn't have been a problem. Close up though, it is a little noticeable. Finally, the lack of weight in the nose is half my fault for not thinking about it and half the fault of the instructions for not mentioning it. In the future, I'll try and remember to add some to avoid this again. Sounds like some foreshadowing to me. Ah, oh, not again. On the other hand, there are lots of good things about this model kit. The detail was really good. Like I mentioned earlier, I've had 148 scale kits with much worse. The fit of the parts was excellent too, with no filler being needed and only minimal cleanup required. Definitely worth it for the price. Speaking of, how much did I spend? I paid about £4 for this model a number of years ago, which is actually a really good price given the quality of the kit. A quick search online when I made this video though would make it seem that this kit is a little more scarce as prices seem to range from £5 up towards some absolutely insane amounts. If you desperately wanted this kit and could financially justify spending between £5 and £10 on it, then that's not so bad but anything over that and I'd honestly consider looking for something else. Whilst I've spoken about the quality of the kit, it's time to now reflect on my skills and the techniques I used. The build didn't really present any challenges and it wasn't hard to complete. I didn't exactly push myself on this one and opted to use the fairly simple silver spray paint that I've used a number of times before. The spray paint, being cheap, hasn't given the most convincing finish in this tiny scale but for larger models it has worked well in the past. Perhaps if I were to do this one again I'd use a different paint to give a more scale accurate finish. That being said though, it does look quite good for the amount of work I put in. If you were a beginner looking for an easy silver finish, this one isn't bad. The display base, although simple and to my normal design, looks quite good at framing the model. It's only when you hold it in your hand do you realise how small it really is. I think though, it's probably time to wrap this one up. This is a great little kit with some fantastic detail and mould quality that is suitable for completing in a day or two. For me, I'm pretty happy with the way that my F86F Sabre in 1 to 144 scale from Trumpeter has turned out. Let me know in the comments what you thought of my build and any suggestions for future videos you might like to see. Have you already built this kit and did you enjoy it as much as I did? If you enjoyed this video, click that like button to let me know. And if you're new here, please consider subscribing so you don't miss any future modeling uploads. Shout out to my patrons and channel members. Thanks to these guys for helping these videos be produced. Finally, all that's left to say is a massive thank you to you for watching this and I'll see you on the workbench again next time.